to our special technical show. The next crucial theme for technicians, whether a stock is overbought and therefore ripe for a pullback or oversold, maybe ready for a bounce. You determine whether a stock is overbought or oversold by charting the ratio of higher closes, also known as the Relative Strength Index, or RSI. The Relative Strength Index is a momentum oscillator that measures the direction a stock is going and the velocity of the move. We like to match the relative strength of an individual stock to something else, perhaps the relative strength of its sector or maybe that of a larger index, and we measure the price action historically. We're always looking for anomalies where strength stands out because that's a sign of a pending move, perhaps a momentum switch that we wouldn't know if we had just read the research on the stock. For relative strength chart work, I often turn to Bob Lang and Tim Collins, both of whom have done remarkable work on this topic and you hear about all the time on the show. Many technicians vary the length of time over which they measure relative strength. Both Lang and Collins like to use shorter periods of time, 10 days, two weeks, to get a beat on the relative strength of the stocks they look at. They're looking for any pattern that reverses the action of the previous period because that's the sign that a breakout or a breakdown of some magnitude might be upon us. They love strong relative strength situations, but they also like to time their bot their bot after pullbacks get that better entry point. They really care about basis. Typically, when a stock gets overbought, it is ripe for pullback because overbought stocks, ones with many buyers reaching to take in supply, tend to snap back after they've gotten too far away from their longer-term trend line. The inverse can be true, too. A stock can fall so far, so fast, that you should expect a snapback because it's technically oversold. You hear me use these terms. We see these patterns constantly. They're reliable indicators that a change in direction is about to occur. These are terrific action points, people. If you are debating buying a stock there, if you've done all the research and you find the stock is overbought, I usually tell you to wait for a pullback. That almost always comes... That's because Lang and Collins have done enough chart work to know that the vast majority of stocks overshoot directions and then retrace some of those moves back to better entry or exit points. Hey, a retracement isn't necessarily negative. Charting, though, is tricky. Periodically, some stocks are so strong they break, break through all the ceilings of all traditional significant measurement periods, and then they stay overbought, perhaps for weeks at a time, defying the historical tra trading patterns that have hitherto trapped them within the bands of extremes. They defy the notion of the inevitable uh, gravitational pull of the old equilibrium line and just can't be contained by any of the various ceilings that overbought conditions usually bump into and come crashing down from. When you spot these highly unusual moves, you know what? You may have to strap yourself in to get a real moonshot. And we, let's take a look at this one. This is what I mean. This is rare, but when it happens, it's big money. We saw it occur in July of 2009, as Dan Fitzpatrick pointed out to me, using a stochastics oscillator. That's another momentum indicator that helps spot a bottom, this time in Las Vegas Sands. This summer, the stock of Las Vegas Sands, one of the largest casino companies with a very important business in Macau, again, not that it mattered to the charters, had been repeatedly stalled at the 10 buck level, falling every time it hit. Boom, boom, boom. You know, just not working, okay? But... When the bulls finally broke out of the corral, there was no stopping them, and the stock gained relative strength after it pushed through instead of regrouping to cover from its overbought status. That's a very rare pattern. You see this thing? It just stayed overbought, which told you good things were going to be ahead. It never retreated as you would have expected. Buyers wouldn't quit despite the stock being overbought, and that is a sign the strongest kind of positive move in the book might be taking place. At any given time, I'm expected to pull back, but no, you had that gigantic long-term overbought. This stock proceeded to go from $10 to $48, pretty much in a straight line with no substantive pullback to, be, to speak of. An overbought condition that can stay overbought is a golden opportunity for a huge move. Look, it came right back to being overbought again. Remember, I like to marry the fundamentals with the chart, so I'm not too dependent on the pictorials. But what was happening underneath this chart that it was able to stay overbought for so long? Well, you know what was going on right then? That's when the chief locus of profits for Las Vegas Sands went from being Vegas to Macau. The only place in China where gambling is legal. The change transformed LVS from a so-so Nevada gaming company into an international powerhouse that might as well have been named Macau Sands. The charts told you about the transformation well ahead of the Wall Street analysts who were still dazed that we had had such a horrendous decline to begin with. They weren't thinking about Macau here. The chartists were thinking there's buyers lurking. Volume is another key tool to chartists. They use that to spot pivots. We often say that volume is a lie detector, okay, telling us whether a move is for real or not. When there is a small move on light volume, the technicians ignore it. 
But when there is a small move on heavy volume, the chart is drilled down laser-like to see if it's a precursor to something bigger and infinitely more tradable. Chartists are at all times looking either for accumulation on big volume, meaning that large money managers are beginning to accumulate stock in an aggressive way, or distribution. That's a synonym for selling of a stock, and that could telegraph a big decline. They measure these moves by something called an accumulation distribution line. When the calculation of the accumulation distribution line is arcane, involving the data, I know it is, charting of whether a stock closes higher on greater volume or on any given day versus lower on low volume, again, any brokerage house will actually offer you the kind of charting on its website. I care passionately about it because it can go against the grain of conventional thinking about a stock, and that's why I love charts so much. They go against the fundamentals sometimes, and sometimes they're right. We saw them being right in Monsanto in July of 2012. This was an unbelievable one that I completely got wrong. Thank heavens for the chart. I didn't care for this stock at the time. I didn't like GMOs. I was kind of biased, you know. Tim Collins saw it another way. He said the accumulation distribution line showed that while the stock had down days, they were on light vibes. So all the down days, you had low lines here. And then on a heavy volume on the up days. That's a sure sign that more money was flowing into the stock than out of it. Collins noted that such a consistent, persistent accumulation or buying pattern versus the distribution or selling pattern convinced him that large funds were building positions to own the stock long term, not to rent it for a quick move. It turns out that what I didn't see what I was so confused about was that Monsanto's stock had started to be correlated with the price of corn, which was going higher back then because of newfound demand for ethanol engendered by government price supports. I was far too concerned about near-term earnings and worries about a shortfall and wasn't thinking big picture, but the chart showed you big picture. The work of Collins told you not to fear. It was showing you that something bigger was developing than just the quarter. He was dead right. And a stock that I would have kept you out of turned out to be a big winner when corn shot up, taking Monsanto's stock and its earnings up with it. Uh, the big boys knew the relationship with corn and Monsanto's business. You were able to piggyback off their research by using Collins' work, which isolated the real underlying strength of the stock as depicted by the accumulation distribution line. I got smoked. He saw it. Bottom line. We need to look at lots of different indicators to spot big moves. Indicators like accumulation distribution, overbought, oversold levels, to spot important turns that might not be visible otherwise to those of us stuck trying to spot changes in the fundamentals that often are further out in time. Powerful moves can and often do elude those who are only focused on the underlying companies and not the action of the stocks themselves. Let's go to Dan in Illinois, please. Dan. Kramer, booyah. Thank you for demystifying the market and helping us it, make it accessible. Well, that's what I want. My I want question. everybody to understand their money. That's my goal. How can I help? Thank you. I'm wondering if I start with a small position in a stock, a company I like, and the stock just keeps going up, the most it comes down is maybe two, two and a half percent. How can I get a size, more sizable stake? My discipline stock? says you missed it. That's one of the things. My discipline will cut, will cut off the downside, which is far more important than cutting off the upside. And if you bought a position in a stock and it just kept going higher and you didn't get any more, well, it's a trade and you got to take it. I, I know people don't want to hear that, but when you violate your basis and pay up, I can show you for years and years and years for my charitable trust, I have done the work. It is almost always a mistake. Chartists use all different types of indicators to spot big moves. That helps them stay ahead of the game and the fundamentals. And now you're ahead, too. Much more mad money ahead. Ted and shoulders isn't only used for preventing dandruff. I'm telling you how it can help you make some money. Then, our technicians and fundamentals like the Jets and the shark, your Sharks, you're not going to want to miss my take on the dynamic between the two. And got a burning question? I'm taking your tweets. Go ahead and tweet me at Jim Kramer, hashtag mad tweets, and I might answer your question on air. Stay with Kramer. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on Twitter. Have a question? Tweet Kramer, hashtag mad tweets. Send Jim an email to madmoney at CNBC.com or give us a call at 1 800 743 CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.